My name is Andy Hubert. I'm, it's my pleasure to come together with you, with my family, worship the Lord. Thank him for this Lord's Day to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And I would like to open our service by reading from Psalm 68. So if you guys would stand with me, let's hear the word of the Lord, and then we'll sing together. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. By his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain, whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. Your congregation, congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided from your goodness for the poor. The Lord gave the word, great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains at home divides the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalmon. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. You have ascended on high, you have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord might dwell there. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Father in heaven, we do come to worship you. We come to sing before you. You have daily loaded us with benefits. You are the God of our salvation, and you do many wondrous things. You do things we do not understand. You scatter your enemies. You give a, a family to the fatherless. You give prosperity to those who are bound. You march before us and you've established your place. God, we wanna know more of your ways today. God, we wanna sing truly in a way that is worthy of your name. Please be with us, God, fall upon us in power. Awaken our hearts and receive glory, do your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
are to reign. Heaven and earth will join to say, all oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Then who shall fall on men they be? All creatures of our God and King. Shadow 
to have a living hope. Amen. Amen. Well, in just a minute, we're going to uh, move into uh, receiving our offerings. I want to explain something that uh, some of you might have a question about. You're new here, and that's okay. Uh, there's boxes up here. There are wooden boxes with little slits in the top. And you'll notice some people, like myself, sheepishly walking forward to put something in there. That's an offering. And it's just our way of telling God we love him and uh, telling him that he's given us way too much that we could ever not give something back to him. So uh, if, if, you're, if that's new, then that's, that's great. There's also another way to give, and it's on the back of your envelope. It's uh, through digital giving. Uh, if you're a part of Generation X or younger, that's your, that's your jam. <laughs> uh, so uh, will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father, how good are you to have given us a living hope? How good is it that we can face the hurdles of this life with a living hope? Father, thank you that as I drove to the emergency room and met Donna Johnson there and Ronnie and Tommy, the lady I met there, Donna, had a living hope. Thank you for saving her from the clutches of death. Thank you also for granting Jim healing in his body. God, we, we lift up those amongst our congregation who are awaiting test results from doctors. God, we also praise you for the good news that Daniel heard from his, from his appointment, that uh, things are just humming along just normal. We also ask God that you would be over our mission team, that as they are in Pennsylvania, they would know that they are very close to our hearts and that we are bringing them before your throne room, asking that you would sustain their hands and you would bless the work of their hands, Lord. Let them work with joy and let them be a living testimony to Jesus Christ, our living hope. God, we also want to give you thanks for what you have given to us. Lord, AC in our homes to keep them cool, um, cars to drive to work, work to, to glorify you with, our voices to lift back up to you, God. What haven't you given us that we shouldn't give a portion back to you? So be pleased with what we have, what little we have. And let us know from your side what you see, that it's beautiful, that it's more, more than enough, even though it might just be a little bit to us, it's a lot to you. So God, be pleased both with our voices and our gifts. In this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior.
may be seated, friends. Morning, church. My name's Ronnie. Charles and I are blessed to teach a Sunday school class on Sunday morning called the Shepherd's Corner in the bottom of the youth building, right-hand side of the hallway as you go back to the very last class. We have some great discussions. We right now are studying the book of Jeremiah. We have one more lesson in that, and then we're going to be, in one week, we're going to do the entire book of Lamentations. And then next quarter, we're going to be going into the Gospel of Mark. And uh, Charles and I have one complaint about our lesson material. There is so much we miss between lesson to lesson. Because they, cover, they don't carry this, cover this chapter, they go to this one, and then they might skip the next chapter. So we may just start from one and go through the whole thing no matter how long it takes. I don't know. Charles, I'll have to discuss that. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to the book of Numbers, chapter 10. Begin reading with verse 33. If you have the Pew Bible, that is page 174. So they departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them for the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out from the camp. So it was, whenever the ark set out, that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve these dear people again. I want to thank you for the good singing. You certainly are worthy of it. We don't deserve any of the riches of your kindness towards us through Christ. But once again, here we are, glad recipients of them. I want to thank you for your meticulous care over this flock these last couple of weeks especially. I want to thank you for allowing so much grace to flow from person to person in this congregation. I want to thank you for um, your mercy that we found new once again this morning. And I'm so thankful that we don't have to find Monday's mercy today. 
you will most certainly provide it. And since you are the glory and the lifter up of our head, you will provide grace to lift our heads again tomorrow. We are so confident in your grace and in your mercy. We know that you will take all of us safely home in due time. Until then, O oh Lord, thank you for the good help from godly men, our deacons, good pastors, like pastors Randy, Jordan, and John, and how helpful they are to me. Thank you for the care with which they've looked after this congregation in recent days, and I thank you that one day the load will be lighter on all of us. Thank you for being kind and keeping us together. It is a miracle that through all these years you have seen fit, despite the wicked one's best efforts, to hurt our flock, that you have kept us together. I bless your name. And for those, and for those who are temporarily removed from us, we know that in your good time, they will return. We bless you that we will have opportunity in your good and compassionate providence to care for them once again as one of our own. But if not, we know that your goodness will restore the years that the canker worm has eaten, and it will allow our deserts to blossom like roses. Thank you for the kindness that you give to us in the washing of our eyes with tears, in the quaking of our souls under gospel truth that never changes. We thank you for a short journey home, knowing that soon uh, heaven will be on earth and your glorious kingdom will come. We are so thankful that in a land where there will be no misunderstandings, no hasty decisions, no measured problems, no misevaluations, misunderstandings, mismanagements, mismeasurements, we're grateful that you are bringing a day, and until that day, we are thankful that you give us grace, good friends to walk the journey with. Somehow, there's glorious. Grace. Grace. And we bless your name for giving us grace that we didn't need yesterday, or we would have had it. Grace that we would not identify as what it is today. You have allowed us to bear loads that we would not carry and could not carry until you provided the grace. And so, Lord, it is time for your flock to eat. And I pray for all of the reasons that I prayed for it up until this hour, but so many of the more reasons now that you would keep me and my deep heaviness. out of the way that you would preach through me as you have preached to me. I feel like it's just you and me. I feel like a child. And I want to thank you that that's all that I am. All right. Thanks for your help. Amen. Amen.
All right, so friends, in times like these where we both understand and don't understand how we feel, it's important that we stick together like a family. And uh, for that reason, I just want to tell you, ladies, I wish that you would join my wife in registering for this ladies' event. On, um, you have, like, I think another week, yes, August 20th. Please make sure, if you're able, to set aside September 30th to gather with the ladies of Sandy Ridge. Gentlemen, you have two opportunities this week. Again, I think, I think, yes. Today is the, is the 13th. So this Saturday, we have the men's breakfast. Please sign up for that on the bulletin. And tomorrow night, isn't it tomorrow night, Chuck? Where is he? Is he on security? Is tomorrow night the second? Yeah. yeah, the second Monday, there's basketball. So you're like, I hate basketball. Well, come tomorrow if you'd like and visit and watch the rest of us struggle through it. And, um, and maybe you can talk with people. There's an ice cream social to pray for our kids who are going back to school later this month on a Sunday night after the service. Please be a part of that. And then the fellowship that everyone loves is tonight after the evening service, we'll have our monthly business meeting at seven o'clock. I know you're eager for that. We have new members to vote in and we have a few decisions to make as a family. All right, so Numbers chapter 10, you've heard the text. You've read verses 38 through chapter 11, verse three. And um, I think that some review would be helpful. Uh, you know that they're camping and they've been camping for almost a year. Part of that year was setting up and building the tabernacle and outfitting the priests and frankly, legislating how they're going to worship God. It's a theocracy. God said, here's how you're going to worship me and their responsibility was to say, yes sir, and to do it. And so that's our responsibility today. I wonder if you look back at Exodus chapter number 40, please. It's going back just a little bit, but I want to provide a little bit of background. Go back two books to Exodus chapter number 40, and I want you to notice uh, verse, the last two, well, the last three or four verses of the chapter. So Exodus 40. Sandy Ridge, I want to thank you again for allowing me to serve you this morning, and my prayer is that you'll be blessed and strengthened and that the grace of our Lord will rest heavily on you. And uh, this week we've had some good events. Uh, today, specifically, celebrates 12 years of church membership for Linda Jones and Steve and Hazel Fulbright. So congratulations on making it 12 years at Sandy Ridge Baptist Church. Yeah. Now, today is also the third anniversary of Colin and Lucille Duggar's daughter passing away in her 40s. Of, uh, of illness, and they want to make sure that you know this is a special day to, for them as well on the third anniversary of their daughter passing and going to heaven. And so we, we both mourn and celebrate with you, and we're thankful for this. This week we've had some great anniversaries to celebrate. Uh, the Dyes have celebrating their 17th, so congratulations on your 17th wedding anniversary. Yes. And... Um, and then the Murdochs, uh, Mike and Trish are celebrating the 31st anniversary. That's great, yes. And Ronnie and Danielle Hicks, let's see, they're 19th, is that right? Congratulations on your 19th wedding anniversary. And uh, let's see, Harlan and Rosalie, I don't see there this morning, but 43 years, they're probably celebrating, I think I have that right, yeah, 43 years of marriage for them, but there's some birthdays that are pretty important. Now, I can't mention all of them, but Donna Johnson, you heard she was in the hospital, I guess that's where we celebrate birthdays sometimes, she turned 75. Now, back on the other end of the scale, Wade Murdoch turned 18, so he is now an adult, he can... He, he's probably felt like an adult his whole time, but he is now able to go into the military if he wants to without his mother signing the permission slip. And, um, so, and then also, which I don't recommend, so also, um, it, it will do some things to you. Let's see, another big birthday this week was Rolf Myers turned 85 years old. How about that? Yeah. That's great. 85. Keeping young, man. I mean, you look good. All right. 
See, if I say that to a lady, everyone's like, he's flattering, he da-da-da-da, he needs to shut his face and just preach. But I can say it to a dude, and no one's going to think, oh, he's kissing up. All right. So you're noticing the last several verses of Exodus 40. You're going to notice verse number 34. When the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This is not a Polaroid. This is a painting. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not journey till the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle. So you saw that it filled the tabernacle in verse 35. You see that it was above the tabernacle in verse 38. Probably just as it's pictured. You should picture this pillar of cloud in the day, pillar of fire at night, that goes all the way through the roof of the tabernacle onto the ark of the covenant. And verse 38, the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journey. So when it was time to move, this cloud picks up and sort of lays down and starts moving. Strange. So maybe that'll help a little bit as we go back to Numbers chapter number 10. Numbers 10. And as you're finding that place again, you're noticing... Uh, that this is, uh, gracious, a little delay today on this. Uh, they ha- were situated around the tabernacle in this order. And usually, usually, the Levites were halfway through. So it was, okay, these three guys and their tribes, they move out. These three tribes, they move out. That's stipulated in Numbers chapter number 2. But then what's stipulated is that these guys, the Levites, would fall in behind them. But for whatever reason, you see here in Numbers chapter 10 and verse number 33 through 36, that's not the order in which it was given. All right, moving on. So, again, having a difficulty. Next slide, please. Uh, Okay, so this was the intended journey. From Egypt, right up here to the promised land. We find it from Deuteronomy 1. It was about 11 days journey. It it only took them 40 years. And so here they are wandering over here in northern Arabia and then in the areas to the south and east of the Holy Land. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, we remember from this passage of Scripture up on the slide that the reason that this passage was written has two functions. One, to make your life better. Literally, you, a Christian, are supposed to have a better life because of these verses. Look at that. You're supposed to find hope and admonition from what you hear today. All right. So that means we're involved in this passage somehow. But how are we involved in this passage? That's a great question. Um, I'm finding five ways in which you and I are involved in this passage. So here's some things that you can see. This text looks so easy, you're kind of like, what are we going to do with this? Why isn't he taking more verses? Well, frankly, it's because I think that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ at Sandy Ridge uh, can stand for some small bites, I don't, I don't think that we have to cover an entire chapter of Scripture for us to benefit. Frankly, I think that there's plenty on each page to benefit us. And here in this passage, we find out that the Lord is telling us five things. Number one, we are led by promise. Now, what does that mean? Well, you'll notice in verse number 33, they departed from the mountain of the Lord. They've been there a full year. And now it is time to move on. And they are supposed to go three days journey. Now the Ark of the Covenant, verse 33, of the Lord went before them three days for three days journey to search out the resting place for them. If you'd like to, you can write down in the margin right there, Joshua chapter 3, verse 4, which says that the Ark of the Covenant was about 3,000 feet in front of the rest of the camp, about 2,000 cubits. Okay, 
this seems easy enough then. But what is this piece of furniture? What exactly is this Ark of the Covenant that's going before them? Well, it is a demonstration. It's a demonstration that God, the God of the Hebrews, makes promises. And he makes promises that he intends on keeping. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I hope you can remember when the Lord made a promise to Eve and to Adam that first Eve would be the mother of all living and that Adam would have, he and Eve would have a child that would crush a serpent's head. It's called, because it was made in the Garden of Eden, the Edenic Covenant. And and then the Lord made that promise to the human race, but then, then what? Well, then They fell from him and kept falling from him and kept falling from him for about 15 or 1600 years. And the Lord moved in again and made another promise after he drowned everyone. That's a strange way to do it, but that's what he did. He said, I'm going to start over again and I'm going to make a promise. And the promise is that I promise you, human race and animals, I will never drown everyone again. Oh, now that's a promise that I can live with. And he is making that promise. He's basically saying, I'm not going to give up on my creation. I'm making you a promise. And you can depend on my promises. There is still somebody who makes promises that we can depend on. And what did he do to remind them of the promises that he made? He prescribed a piece of furniture Well, why did he do all that? Why go through all the trouble to build a piece of furniture that demonstrates promises? So that they would remember that the reason they exist is not because they're good people. I mean, you remember about 700 years later, well, I mean, we could just get to Abraham. He makes a promise to Abraham. God makes a promise to the entire human race, particularly the woman, that she would bring a serpent crusher in Genesis 3. About 1,500 years later, he makes a promise uh, to the world that he'll never drown her again, an everlasting covenant it's called. But, but then he focuses in on a particular ethnicity, the Hebrew people, and says, I'm going to make a promise to one specific ethnicity. I'm going to promise you that I will bless everyone through you. I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through you. And then he made a promise to the people again and gave them a law. He said, I'm going to make it easier but harder for you to follow me. I'm going to make you a promise. And the Lord made a promise with the Hebrews. And he said, you're a forgetful people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a demonstration Eh, three or feet, three or four feet wide, three or four feet long, two or three feet tall, and we're going to call it an ark. And in that ark, I'm going to put demonstrations of my promises. The tablets of the covenant are going to be put in that ark. Yeah, a jar of manna is going to be put in that ark. We're going to put Aaron's rod in that ark. So that every time you see that moving piece of furniture, you're going to remember not that you are a, oh, get, get this, Not that necessarily you're a good people, but that you have a good God. And and frankly, that is what we follow our whole lives. I think, and I can only say this so many times, family, I think of all the ways in which human beings will let you down. It is nearly a constant speech of mine to say, I'm afraid I'm going to let you down to new members and to consistently apologize to people and ask their forgiveness for ways in which I have. Many of you are already tired of hearing it, and many of you no doubt will continue to hear it, because the truth is, if there's anything that should be easy to do in Christ's church, especially people who have joined by covenant, is to walk up to people and say, you know what I'm made of. And I need your forgiveness. That should be a regular thing in our body. That should be a regular thing that we know how to do with one another. And then somehow move beyond it and follow not what we think that person ought to be, 
but what God has promised to be. And so we rely on these promises and we follow them. We find them each day in our quiet time and we think about how the Lord has promised good to me not because I'm a swell guy. No, purely because Jesus Christ is perfect and all the riches of his grace, all the riches of God's grace that the Christ has earned, God pours them out this morning on the believer. Yeah, all of them, somehow. That is why Paul said in Romans 8, 32, who's gonna lay any charge to God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is going to condemn you? It is God who justifies. It is Christ who died. Yes, rather Christ who's risen again, who's even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. So friends, this morning, when you're not sure which way to go, just bank on the promises of God. And then allow that to help you know how to receive things from people and how to give them to them. You know, when we're at a good party, usually we don't want to go. We know that we have limitations. We need rest, we need help, and we're like, this is good, but I've got to go. And, and, and then there are times when we hope it never ends. Celebrations and happiness, and we're thinking, well, there's no chance this could get better, and I'm afraid that the letdowns are going to start at some point because the devil always knows how to ruin a good party. And we dread that. We dread that. But those who by faith step into relationship with the Lord, they, it's like course after course of a God who does not overpromise. He brings out something and says, you didn't count on this, but here it is. And, and just when you're thinking this party has got to end at some point because God can't be this good, we're, we're flubbixed with a verse like Ephesians 2, 7 that says in the ages to come, God will keep showing us the exceeding riches of his grace. Even in the eternal halls of heaven, God will not run out on goodness. Next. And, and I know what time it is. Next. I need help, please. Advance the slide. We're gonna come back to number two, but how about number three, bearing the promises or bearing the load. You heard Andy read at the beginning of the passage, at the beginning of the service, he daily loads us with benefits. We have studied in this room before on a Wednesday, maybe a Sunday night, about how the Lord blessed Kohath by not giving them carts on which to carry their load. The Merariites, we talked about them, they got to, carry, they got to have wagons to carry the framework and the poles and the sockets of their labor. And the Gershonites, they got wagons to carry the, carton, the, the, the curtains and the veils. They got wagons. But we find out in the book of Numbers, chapter number seven, that the Kohathites got nothing. No wagons, no oxen to pull them. It says, and here's what it says in the book of Numbers, chapter number seven, verses one through eight because theirs was to carry the ark. You see, we're used to, in the scripture, noticing that the ark of the covenant is a picture of God's presence. When that ark went before them, it was like God's presence going before them. Yes? So every time, you can see here in verse number 35, it was whenever the ark set out, Moses said, rise up, O Lord! In other words, the ark went before them because it was like God going before them. The Lord rested in his glory cloud right on this piece of furniture. And then there was a process where they would cover the furniture. The Kohathites would get in, pick it up, put it on their shoulders and carry it. And you've got to know what was being taught here. When you, hmm, oh, it's so easy to say, but so hard to say. When the Lord gives us an opportunity to dwell close to him, Sometimes he gives us no wagons to pull it. Sometimes we carry a load that we never asked for. We carry it on our shoulders. We don't get wagons or oxen like the Gershonites and the Merariites. We're over there with Kohath carrying the, the candlestick, yes, 
the table of showbread, yes. Uh, the, the, the altar of incense, yes. The, the brazen altar, yes. The labor, yes. But the ark upon which God dwelt, so that when the ark was in the camp, they felt like God was in the camp. When the ark went before them, they felt like God went before them. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? These Levites who had to carry the ark, they felt like, man, nobody has to bear the load that I have to carry. But nobody else got to carry the symbol of God either. And so there is a, oh, there is a particular promise to the person in this room today, sitting in these pews, you feel like your load is heavy, and the reason your load seems heavier than other people's loads is because God has picked you to bear a symbol of his presence, a glory that other people don't get to experience, because frankly, God picked them to have wagons to carry their stuff by his divine sovereignty. Some of you are carrying deep, thunderous loads. Daughters that die young. Sunday school classes that are thinning out. Some of you are dealing with marriages that are troubled, jobs that are relentless, neighborhoods that are hostile. Why did God give you that to carry? So that you would sense his presence. And singing comes best from bursting hearts. Next slide. Next slide. Then, in the middle of all this, you'll notice in verse 36, there was a time when they would pitch camp again. Moving is fine. A lot of us want to keep moving. But there comes a time when people have to rest. And often, the camp rests when it likes moving And it's human nature that God's people want to move when it's time to rest. Here, we have to be willing to allow the Lord for a little season to halt our progress. And sometimes it's painful, but in this passage, we're being taught that when things get comfy, the Lord says, get up, it's time to It's time to go forward, and sometimes, without asking our permission, nowhere do we see God dipping out of the cloud saying, how's everyone doing down there? He doesn't appear to care. And there are gonna be times when it doesn't seem like God cares. You and I are those disciples on the boat sometimes that go and wake the master up. Don't you care? that we're dying. Do you imagine how much it hurt our master to know how much he cared and to be asked, don't you care? And we're going to be tempted at times to say, is anyone up there? And that moving cloud, sometimes silent. Maybe at night, Pastor Jordan, when it burned, it made noise. But moving clouds, they don't always make noise. It's a gentle, strange, what is that? What makes the thing move? But just divine breeze. Next slide. Then then there is remembering with emotion. See, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, please notice, when the people complained, how in the world are they complaining? Why are they complaining? 
We're talking about people that got up off their cots every morning, went outside, and there's bread on the ground. Every evening, there are quail flying so low they can reach out and smack one. They've experienced it for a year, and when they needed warmth, they had it at night. When they needed cool, misting breezes, they had it in the day. And somehow, in verse 1, it's time to complain. They've moved their three days, and now it's time to complain. The Lord heard it. (laughs) I mean, to me, that's kind of funny. I mean, of course he did. He's omnipresent. But here, the writer, for whatever reason, by divine spirit said, the Lord said, I hear you. And his anger was aroused. That's difficult too. I don't like thinking about an angry God. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Now, I don't know how this happened. Like, was this at night and that pillar of fire is above them and then it just down on the ends and zapped a few of them on the edge of the camp? Not sure. The people cried out to Moses when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place to bear up because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. For whatever reason, they forgot how it felt to be in Egypt. For whatever reason, they, they mm, friends, be patient with me. For whatever reason, they forgot how it felt to be moving under God's grace. And When we look around, we're reminded uh, of the the perplexity of, of being frustrated when it looks like people aren't hurting enough. And then we're frustrated when people can't seem to move on from their hurt. And I hope that we can see here a little tender reminder that emotion is very